Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Tom Stewart here. Got my partner, Liz Trotter. Hey, Liz. Hey. Got a very special guest with us today, Joe Walsh from Clean Maine out of Portland, Maine. Hey, Joe. Hi, everybody. And we were talking a little bit about Molly. So Molly's uh, joining me here today as well. Say hello, Molly. <laughs> <laughs> Molly is, uh, I guess she'll be eight weeks old here in a, in a couple of days. She's almost eight weeks old. She's a, uh, uh, some type of labradoodle. I don't know. Anyway, um, I the dog and so, um, Joe, let's just jump right into this thing a little bit. Well, you know, the, obviously PPP is on top of everybody's mind. There's, uh, some recent guidance has come out. There's, uh, so SBA has come out with some, some, some information, I guess, actually a kind of a form that one presumably be using to go through to figure out what the forgiveness part of the PPP is. And, you know, since we've been doing this over the last few months, it seems like every time you think you know something, you just find out that it changed the next day. So tell us, will uh, this PPP guidance be any different, Joe? So uh, for those of you that don't know, the SBA finally on Friday released their long awaited guidance, very specific guidance on how the forgiveness provisions of the PPP will work. And this guidance comes in the form of a, an actual form that you would fill out. And this is from the SBA. So that's what we've all been waiting for. Like, tell us exactly how the forgiveness provisions are going to work. And so we have that now. Um, the, and then of course, as soon as it came out, there were questions about the form itself, but this is the most specific information we've gotten about how this loan is gonna be forgiven. Now, the development that happened yesterday is that there are more and more um, senators and representatives are coming out publicly saying that they are going to be backing changes to the law that created the PPP and not, not just rules changes, but also changes to the law. So it, it is looking more and more likely that the rules that were just released on Friday uh, will be obsolete within the next couple of weeks. So I can get a little bit more specific about that in terms of, so I live in Maine, I live in Portland, Maine, and our, one of our U.S. Senators, Susan Collins, was one of the four senators that authored the original act that created the PPP. She's also on the small business committee in the Senate. I may not have the technical name right um, on that, but she's involved with the small business committee on the Senate. And um, along with Marco Rubio in Florida, um, co-authored the bill. And they are both backing changes to the original bill. This is very new. Before they, they were insisting um, that it was a huge success and that you know, that they weren't going to be making any changes. So this is shift that they are now backing um, changes in the bill. And it's looking like two major things will most likely change. And I want to emphasize this has not been changed yet, but um, it's looking more and more likely. There was a great piece in the Wall Street Journal yesterday that went into this in a little bit more detail. But the two major things that it's looking like will change is the original eight week period that was being considered for loan forgiveness would be extended to 16 weeks. And it's also looking like they may change the 75% rule. So it's like that 75% of the loan has to be spent on payroll. Um, they may be relaxing those rules. And these changes would come both in the form of rules changes, which happen directly from the SBA and the treasury, and also in the form of new legislation. So. The last thing I would add is that Marco Rubio said that the that their intent in the Senate is to get something passed so that the first recipients of the PPP, when their eight weeks come up, the new rules are in effect before their eight weeks. So what that means is the first loans were distributed on April 6th. I'm looking at my calendar to check my memory, but yes, April 6th, which was a Monday, and their eight weeks comes up two weeks from today. So that's a pretty tight timeline, but there's broad bipartisan support to make changes to the program. Right, and within two weeks, we should have 
well, we'll probably have at least one change, but who knows how many more <laughs> within two weeks, right? Right, right. And it's we're, we're entering in this phase again where the changes had kind of slowed down for a while and it seemed to be entering into a phase where I think there's going to be some more changes coming down the pike. So the way that I'm approaching it with my business, so for those of you that don't know, um, that don't know me, I own a residential cleaning company in Portland, Maine, Green Clean Maine, and we have or had 32 employees before the crisis. And I furloughed, I furloughed all of them. I was closed for six weeks and we reopened two weeks ago. And we now have uh, 18 employees and we're slowly rebuilding, uh, rebuilding the staff. Um, but uh, in any event, um, I took the BPP loan and I have a plan on how to use it under the current rules. So what, what I've done is said, how am I going to use it under the current rules with the understanding that I don't need to get super specific and concerned about it because it's probably going to change in a way. So that's kind of been my approach uh, to it so far. Any, oh. any word, Joe, on the June 30th um, FTE timeline where you have to have the the correct number of FTEs on June 30th before, after, did you hear anything about that? So my understanding of the rules as they are written uh, is that um, that June 30th, they've given that a name now, it's called the safe harbor deadline. And the employee safe harbor deadline says that if you restore your uh, pre-crisis headcount to the full amount of FTEs, by June 30th, that all of the forgiveness reduction provisions will be removed from the loan. So where that would apply is, let's say you only brought back 20 of your 30 employees uh, in your eight week period. If by June 30th, you're back to your full 30 employees, the whole loan will be forgiven or well, the forgivable expenses will be fully forgiven, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the, my understanding of it, that's the understanding that I've gotten from my accountant. But um, as I've said on previous calls here, I really encourage you to speak to your own accountant. I, I know that Tom and Liz, you have actually have an accountant coming on tomorrow to talk about the some of this stuff, right? Yes. yes. Megan Megan Likes has, has agreed to join us tomorrow. So uh, excellent. This time, you know, tomorrow we'll, yeah. we'll have another authoritative voice who's spent a whole lot of time studying this subject. Okay. Yeah, I I think what's important to something else that I've learned about the PPE or about the PPP and how to use it is that, you know, if you are um, uh, like reopening, you can actually, if you know you're going to bring back a certain percentage of your staff, like you have enough work to bring back a certain percentage of your staff, you can calculate how much of the PPP you expect to get back and use some of that money, how much of it you'll get forgiven and use some of that money to pay differentials. So we've been able to pay differentials to our staff that m at least match what they were making on unemployment. Because if, you're, if you've had to lay people off, depending on what state you're in, your employees may be making, are most likely making more unemployment with the new federal subsidy uh, than they were before they, um, you know, before you furloughed them. So getting employees to come back can be uh, can be problematic, and you can use the forgiveness funds from the PPP to help finance differentials for employees. So we've been able to do that, and we're bringing back enough employees, and we'll get enough forgiven that we're actually paying all of our employees um, between nine hundred and eleven hundred dollars a week. And we just set like a minimum, a minimum salary for them for the week. And we're using the PPP funds to cover that difference because obviously we couldn't afford to pay those kind of wages with the revenue that's coming in. Yeah, of course. With some of the, I guess, possible changes that your, 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 your senators are backing along with, with, with other members in Congress, does that change the calculus any? I mean, the strategy made sense when you had an eight week window, if you had a 16 week window, do you do something different? I think that you, 
it depends on what your approach was in the first place. So if your approach in the first place was bring back as many people as possible, I don't care if I'm paying them to, you know, shine shoes or clean the carpet or whatever, you know, I'm just going to pay them so I can get the full amount forgiven. I think that, you know, if that's been your approach, you might be able to change or soften that approach. Although there, it's questionable whether you'd be able to go back on that now that you've brought everybody back on payroll. I think if your approach has been like mine, which is to set the money, sort of mentally set it aside and operate as if I didn't have it and then just take whatever forgiveness I get. If you have that approach and you're bringing back staff slowly, it allows, it takes the pressure off, I think, in your plan to try and bring back as many as possible in a shorter period of time as possible and does give you more flexibility to bring back your staff more according to customer demand. So you'd bring them back, you know, when you have enough business to bring them back and it increases the chances that you're going to get more forgiven because now I have eight, I have 16 weeks to bring people back. And I would presume that's why they're looking to make this change just to allow businesses to make economically rational decisions rather than just do stuff that makes no, no economic sense, just play within the rules that don't make any sense. But on the flip side of that, uh, if you have to, if they're increasing the unemployment benefit and you have to, you know, um, fill that gap over a 16 week period instead of an eight week period, um, PPP is going to really be. <laughs> not enough money. Yeah. No, you yeah. Do it for it's not going to work. Is there a chance they might give us more money? <laughs> I, do, I don't know. <laughs> I that, did. I saw that today, Tom. I sent that to you. So there is an option um, out there to get more money based on uh, the amount that you you the first time that you asked for. You have that link I sent you, Tom? That info information. I wonder if I could find it real yeah, quick. You pull that up. Yeah, there were a couple of different <clears throat> ways that that could happen if I can find it. I also did want to talk about, so they have a lot of these new safe harbor dates, right? Um, one is expiring today, the safe harbor for the repayment of the PPP where you can get it forgiveness forgiven as if you never received it is today if you change your mind and you want to go with the tax credit. With the employee tax, about, tax credit, yes. Say it again. Yeah, so the, the, right. I was just saying the employee retention tax credit is is what you're referring to, right? ERT. Yeah. So if you want to use that, then you the, today's the last day for that. They extended it from Friday. That's or maybe right. it was from Saturday, right? Yeah, it was from Friday. It was supposed to be Friday. They extend or it was supposed to be Thursday actually, uh, and they extended it to today. Because if you take the PPP, you can't use the employee retention tax credit. It has been proposed to allow businesses to use both, but that again is not anything that's been passed. It's just a proposal that's floating around out there. Yeah, I, I think the, the proposals are <laughs> almost what causes more problems. All right, let's see, here we go. I'm pulling this out of my mastermind group. So give me just a second here. Um, okay, so this was, um, so the information, and I can't read all this because it's coming from a, you want to share your screen? <laughs> no, <laughs> this is coming from a, uh, protected source Okay. because it's come from the MMA groups. Um, but I can give this piece of information. Um, if you have owner compensation that was not included in your original application, like K-1 income line 14A, you may be able to request an additional distribution. This amount would be up to the annualized $100,000 cap per person. If you have W-2 wages, both are subject to the cap. This can only be done if the Form 1052 has not been filed from your bank. That means call right now if you're interested. That form was originally due to day form your bank to the SBA. That form was originally due 
Oh, that form was originally due today from your bank to the SBA, but was extended to the 22nd. And it's not clear if it's for all owners or just partnership structures. So if you apply for a PPP loan without including partner income or your K-1 distribution, then you, you might be able to get more money. That was good advice. No, that is good advice. Especially since you only have four days to do that. I think one of the big lessons that I've learned through this whole process so far has been the importance of having a good relationship with a local community bank. Because, you know, for those of you on the call who haven't been able to do that, I, I believe as a business owner, it's really important. And I think smart business owners have a relationship with local community bank. And by that, I mean, you have your larger national banks um, and even regional banks, you know, your national banks like Bank of America and Wells Fargo are two of the big ones that would come to mind. But, um, you know, I do my banking with a local community bank. So they're statewide in the state of Maine and they have a small presence in New Hampshire, uh, which is the next state over. And they have been tremendous to deal with. Um, and I haven't had any of the horror story experiences that I've heard others who maybe are dealing with larger banks would have. So I would definitely just from business owner to business owner say, if you can get a relationship with a local community bank, that it's just an, like in a time like this, it's been an invaluable relationship to have. Cause I can literally call my banker now and ask what you were just talking about, Liz, and he'll tell me what's, what's going on. And I get an immediate response because we have a personal relationship. I'm actually with Bank of America and I've had the same luck. So mm -hmm. just That's because, awesome. Yeah, but I've been with this bank for 45 years. So, I mean, that's probably why I know the bankers have been, you know, my one contact I've been banking with for at least 20 years. So mm. I, I would say just because it's a large bank, don't think you can't call and talk to them. They're happy to go through all the details. Yeah, they, they, at least they, they, the, the key part of that is having a relationship with a banker rather than yeah. with an institution. If yeah. you've got names and relationships and a history and, and a cell phone number, then you've got somebody that, that, that can, can give you the inside skinny on the things that you need to know. Right. One of the things that I read that I also ran by my banker that I really liked was um, all loans that were given, all PPP loans that were less than $2 million are assumed to be accurate. And so they are just being accepted as accurate. Um, and she, she said that there's just a very small amount they're going to be like spot auditing. She said they don't expect it to be more than 1% of all of them that will have a spot audit if you're less than $2 million loan. I was like, well, that's awesome. Yep. Well, Joe, we, we certainly appreciate you uh, taking some time this afternoon and welcome you to, to, to go for the full ride here. But Joe has a previous engagement this afternoon that uh, he's up against a stop. Uh, I don't know how much more time you have, but I don't want you to... Uh, Stay here. Uh, you can afford to. I have to be. Uh, I have to be getting ready to leave my office here in the next couple of minutes. Um, if there's any questions, I'm I'm happy to help out. I mean, I think the the takeaway and, and what I'm happy to share in the call today is stay tuned for the PPP. And as a business owner, I would you know have an idea of how you use the money with the current rules if you already have it. But hang in there because most likely we're going to see rules changes come in the next couple of weeks. And so, uh, but, and I specifically mean before June 1st. So that's what, that's what we're going to keep an eye out for. So stay tuned for more updates on that. And, it, and it's good stuff. It'll be in our favor. And actually it, it will be in our oh favor. Tom, Tom, I don't know if we've shared this previously, but a, a law firm in Boston published a really good Excel spreadsheet that helps business owners calculate their forgiveness percentage. Was this something that we shared, or did we decide that we we wanted to direct people to their own accountants, or what was that? Yeah, we, we, we shared a couple of uh, resources like that. I know we may have shared that one. I, I know that uh, Chad Henley joined us, was it last week? 
and yeah. built a, a a a similar tool but but we've done that and it's all you know couched in the in, with the understanding that the definitive source is your cpa but this will at least get you moving in the right direction that's right that's right okay yeah because the the um the source that I've been using to do with calculations does a really good job of, of kind of helping you understand how the forgiveness is going to work. So, um, well, send that over to us, Joe, if I you will. would. That'd yep. be great. Yep. Definitely. Um, one more thing that I wanted to, not to hold you, Joe. That's fine. Um, just one more thing that I wanted to bring up because I know that a lot of things are changing, but there are some things that, um, like uh, under the documents that each borrower must maintain, even if we're not going to have to submit them, I think we still should be getting that stuff done. Uh, I've talked to quite a few people that haven't even read about the Schedule A worksheet and haven't been filling it out. So, you know, and that, that's a heavier lift after the fact. So mm -hmm. making sure that everybody goes in and, and fills in the stuff that they need to be filling in now, even if they are using um, a, a spreadsheet to be able to track their own information is going to be really important too. Yeah. You know, you got to track it, even if we're not going to have to turn it in. And they want us to track it their way so that they can talk to us in their language. And they're very specific. Actually, that's one place that they're very specific that however you do it, you have to use their language. So yeah. I'm like, okay. Definitely. Know. You know, some payroll providers are developing reports specifically for this, and so it depends who you're using. So our payroll provider is developing a report that specifically follows the Schedule A, so you'll be able to just print it out. Um, but not all payroll companies will do that, so it's, you know, you definitely want to ask what kind of reporting um, from your payroll provider if you use one. Um, and, that, that's and if you're doing it house, you need to get in here and and you're try to to be, be keeping track of it right now yeah from the beginning and you need to be doing it this way not just it's not enough to just put the money in a separate account and write checks off it that's not enough that's right. not going to be enough yep ah uh, did i miss something what is schedule a schedule a joe you want to explain what that is schedule a is a form that the sba released as part of the rules so tom did you post you posted those rules to the resources have we done that yet it's the forgiveness uh the loan forgiveness application it's the loan forgiveness application yeah yeah, yeah I'm schedule a, I'm the sample. schedule a is part of that it's, it's how they want you to keep track of your payroll expenses and it's very specific there you go look at that so bu -bu 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 -bu. How far down is Schedule A? There you go. Those are instructions. There we go. There it is. There it is. Fancy, dancy little thing. But I, you know, it's 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 a government form. Okay, so it's not fun, but it's just one of those things that you. Ha I mean, maybe for some people it's fun, but I think for most people you wouldn't describe this as a fun activity. But. Um, yeah you need to as a business owner familiarize yourself with that you need to understand it i think i'm really surprised i do um i do work with small business small businesses locally and i'm surprised at the number of people who haven't taken the time to familiarize themselves with that just in the current environment you re as a business owner that's going to help you make good decisions financially for your for your company right now so understanding these government forms like it or not, I think is going to be a reality for a lot of us for the foreseeable future. So I think it's something that smart business owners will familiarize themselves with. Um, or uh, you have a good, we're good trust advisor that's right. doing it for you. Sorry, Liz, what? Uh, no, I, 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 I thought you were done, Joe. I'm sorry. So you were oh. saying our trust what? Or you have a very good trusted advisor that does that for you. I mean, that's another valid way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Which is why Tom is posting all of these links in, and all of these um, resources for you guys to check out. Not because we're going through them um, in detail on these calls. We're, we are answering a lot of questions. We're giving you guys as much information as we know. But the smart move, 
smart business moves again is to get in there and look at the information yourself and find out what makes sense for you and your company. Mm -hmm. Just like you heard the way Joe is um, managing his PPP money is different than the way I'm handling mine is different than the way that Tom is handling his. We all three have different strategies based on our, our, the outcomes that we're looking for. So you need to have your own strategy based on what your what outcome you're looking for. But you can only get to that. Anything strategy. else? I, I would just add, you can only get to that strategy with a thorough understanding of the rules and the structure of the program. So that's why you just have to learn it. I just think it's, it's, it can be, it can really make a big difference in the amount of, uh, in, in how financially healthy your business will be this year. So. Yeah, it was funny because we just had a meeting earlier today, kind of running the numbers. Part of the guidance, I guess, that came out over the weekend was giving us another option with our eight week window. You could pull the week window forward two weeks from the date that you got your funds. So you can look at it both ways, the way that we were looking at it for the last, you know, several weeks. And the other option is take whatever date you got your funds and move forward two weeks and then look at what your payroll dollars and your other expenses look like. And for a lot of us who were shut down and starting back up, it's easier to get to full employment if you take advantage of that and pull your eight week window forward two weeks. However, you know, that's going to change again in the next two weeks. Um, stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, I've got to hop off, everybody. Thanks so much for having me today. And um, thank you, thanks, Joe. Thanks so appreciate you coming on. Thank Take you. Care. Yep. Bye bye. Bye. I noticed uh, Allison was with us uh, again today. Hey, Allison. Good to see you. Got a lot of the regulars on here today too. Denise, Audra, Ruth. Yep. Is Leslie on? I haven't seen Leslie. Okay, I don't have yeah. my phone with me today. Leslie was uh, saying hi to Molly. Oh. <laughs> She's so cute. Oh, there she is. Yep. Ah, okay. So, do you guys have any questions? How are you guys doing with your PPP money? I've been having a lot of conversations with people um, around their PPP money. Some people are struggling to figure out how they're going to spend it all. Some people are going to run out early. Uh, some people are, you know, tracking it and trying to hit it exactly right. The thing that I keep reminding everybody is that all of this money, whatever is forgiven, even if you don't get 100% of it forgiven, all of it that you do get forgiven <laughs> is free. That money's free. So, you know, only this much free money is, is not a bad thing. Just because you didn't get this much free money doesn't make this bad. This is still free money. So try not to get like sucked into this thing of, oh, I'm not gonna be able to, this isn't gonna work, I can't get all my people, whatever the whatever the story is. Because that the, that's not the thing you want to be careful though is I mean this the advice of, of, of doing bonuses and like the, the, the COVID-19 bonuses, stuff like that, all that is good strategy once you understand the numbers and understand the rules. Um, got to be careful to make sure that you've got that all planned out, though. If you're handing out bonuses and don't hit your numbers, then theoretically you could be spending money that you thought was going to be forgiven and then it's not and get yourself a little bit upside down. And that money that you were collecting in your bank account. So remember, though, that that money that you were collecting in your bank account, now you're going to have to spend it. So unless you're just not paying attention at all, like just going crazy and not looking at anything, chances are good you're not going to completely mess yourself up. But don't be, don't. So one of the things I heard somebody doing today was that they are just, matching the $600 a week for all of their employees so they can bring their employees back from furlough and give them all $600 a week. Can you afford that? Because I cannot. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you can, but I cannot afford to bring all of my people back, give them $600 additional monies for the entire eight weeks. 
if you can, awesome, more power to you. But make sure that you know that. Don't don't be just thinking, oh, I heard this. That's easy. <laughs> because just because it's easy doesn't mean it's right. And it doesn't mean it's going to work for you. And um, a lot of stuff is not going to work that way. We'll probably get into it to, to fun of this more with Megan tomorrow. But you, know, you want to make sure that whatever the difference is between what monies you got, what PPP monies you got, and what's forgiven, whatever that difference is, you want to make sure you've got that money left over, you know, in the bank to pay it back. You don't want to spend all your PPP monies and then find out that, you know, that your calculation wasn't, wasn't, uh, wasn't correct and it's not being forgiven and you don't have it anymore. That would be bad. And if you're not, cleaning if you're not bringing in revenue to pay those to pay those people that could happen yeah if you're cleaning homes with 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 the money and you got the same gross profit if you will then you're i mean you're you're gold you've got nothing to worry about um if you're paying bonuses that your business can't normally support and that's what you heard joe say Joe's Joe's all over the numbers. He's, you know, he knows what he's doing. He's working with his local bank. He's working with his CPA. He's confident that he knows what his forgiveness number is going to be. Then that works. But if you're spending money, that's not part of your normal expense structure. And then your numbers are off and the, you know, SBA says they want all their, their, their PPP money back. That could be a problem. Yeah. And so if, and I've heard this happening with a lot of people, they got their PPP money and they started paying their people a 40 hour wage, but they weren't actually working yet, working at all. So no revenue coming in, a lot of money going out. That's what we're talking about that you can get yourself into trouble if you're, if you're not careful. If you have revenue coming in, much less of a problem. But again, get yourself one of these fancy dancy worksheets and start tracking your money, tracking how much you're spending, tracking how much you have, how much you have to spend that week. Oh, let's see, what does Deborah say? I also have a new hire. If I'm going to run out early, should I not claim her pay on the PPP? Okay, she, so she says she's gonna run out of uh, PPP money about a week early. Um, so you can, you can claim everybody and all of the monies. It's just how much is going to be forgiven, Deborah. Yeah. That's how that works. And this this kind of gets back in the area of if it's the same pay structure that you have under normal circumstances, just hire her and pay her and clean homes and generate revenue. The PPP will take care of itself. Um, you know, if you're doing something you know, extraordinarily different thinking that I've got these PPP money, so I'm going to come up with this new pay structure because of that, then that's where you might need to, to, to make sure that you know how many of your monies you've spent and, you know, you have the right ratios to payroll versus other expenses. And can you do all the checks to make sure that uh, nobody's, you know, pay has been diminished beyond, you know, the 25%, everybody's making at least, you know, 75%. I mean, there's like a bunch of rules and we go, we have meetings at least once a week just to go through and kind of check to see where we are. And, um, it'll make your head spin. You know, I'm, I'm pretty decent with numbers and I, I, you know, I look at that and say, this is just crazy. Oh, and it's crazier because we don't have all of the, information yet although a lot more of it came out still on friday and over the weekend um we have a spreadsheet to calculate the math yes eloisa it is tom have you put that link go up in this thread eloisa and you'll find the link to it it's moderncleaning.com forward slash coronavirus uh, yeah this is, on is that right? actually but yeah we'll we'll get you the link to, to all the resources here. All right, and I just want to remind everybody that while you're doing this, there are still a lot of people that are not 
um, fully up and running. You heard Joe say that they may be extending that eight week out to 16 weeks. Now think about that. How's that going to impact stuff? Yeah, good. Thanks, Tom. Oh, you're welcome, Eloisa. Um, uh -oh. How is that going to impact uh, what you're doing as far as uh, some of the additional things that we were doing? Like, I know that a lot of people were uh, putting their people through some extensive training. Um, some people were hiring people onto their payroll that they normally wouldn't put on. Uh, I did that. So, you know, those are additional things that you need to be thinking about if you're going, that money's going to be stretched out to see. We had quite a amount to spend the same amount of money. But if we'd have known that right at the beginning, we may have made other decisions. I would have. Yeah. I promise you I would have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And but, there's there's some other um, considerations too, because if you are telling people, so I'm thinking about the $1,923 a week number, I guess that's still going to only be eight weeks. If you're going to try and stretch out to 16, you're going to have to cut that 1923 in half as well. Right. At the very least, in the very least, you want to make sure that you're hiring people that are creating value for you, either generating revenue yeah. or if you've got them, you know, building out your website or doing, you know, marketing plans or stuff like that. It would be stuff that, that, that you'd be doing you know, anyway, if you had the money to do it, now you're just taking advantage of this as an opportunity. Stuff Maybe. to grow your business. Guaranteed, yeah. you need to be doing things to grow your business. The only thing that I have heard anybody not giving credence to is the idea that you have people sit at home, your employees sit at home and do absolutely nothing and you pay them. I have not heard any anyone say, yes, this is a good idea because there's always things that you could have them doing to better your business and to keep them into your work flow and keep them engaged in your company so that when it's over, it's not more painful for them also. So I have a question that came up today, Tom, maybe you can help with. So um, we had an employee and she, let's see, what happened there? So she went on, she was furloughed. And then uh, while she was furloughed, her, her child care, oh no, while she was furloughed, she was injured. Um, she got some stress fractures in her foot and now she can't come back to work and so so what happens with her so we told her you need to come back to work we sent her out a letter saying hey can you come back on such and such day at such and such pay and she said i can't because i'm injured does she come off of unemployment now does she what what do you think happens there I don't know for sure. My yeah. suspicion is she very well could. And since she's been furloughed, she can't ask for sick leave or anything else. And if you if you went that route, then based on the rules as they're written now for the PPP, she would make your head count look better. Yeah, her she makes my head count look better whether she works for me or not right now right. as long as she gives me the letter saying that she can't but as far as for her what's best for her should i bring her back and then have her go out uh, no i guess that doesn't make sense right we're like you can bring, you can bring her back and have her request sick leave and you would pay her under the um, CARES Act sick leave component the FFCRA. And, and you would get that money back at the end of the quarter from your, 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 your payroll taxes. But if she, when we bring her back and then she gets FFCRA, she goes against my FTE number, doesn't she? I think if she's getting FFCRA, you can't, you can't go hit both. Maybe not my FTE number, but no, she can't get PPP dollars. You can't, you can't, you can't double dip on the, 
you can't can't jump on the money side, but she does. I think she does help you on the headcount side. Okay, awesome. All right, that might be the way to go then. It's been really nice for her to be able to get unemployment and uh, the federal unemployment as well. So I'm not sure that she'll be happy to be yanked off of that, put onto FFCRA at 80% of her pay. What you got, Tom? Um, my computer's not behaving right. Oh, that's <laughs> never good. That's never a good thing. Any questions? So anybody else? Anybody else see anything interesting in the information that came out on over the weekend? Which was different, right? We've had some like mellow weekends and then all of a sudden, oh wow, how many pages did we get this weekend? Have to sort through. I guess it can't start it on Friday, right? We got an update yesterday. Uh, you guys are all on top of it. I'm, I'm like so impressed. I, I, I didn't feel like I was on top of it. I, I spent like two hours just reading and reading and reading, only to find out from Joe that they're probably going to change a bunch of this stuff anyway. <laughs> There's oh. a pretty epic piece in Forbes that came out. the other day on basically a deep dive into the uh, PPP loan forgiveness uh, application, kind of a, a different perspective, elaborating on the um, SBA form that we just looked at. I, I just posted it here. I'm almost reluctant to share that now that we believe that these rules are going to change again, but probably doesn't hurt to at least know what we believe they are now. Well, and my, my banker did say one of the things that you really want to do is whatever decisions you make are, are not, they're not going to go against you as long as you're documenting why you made them. You know, you made this decision based on this information and you're going to be good to go. Okay. I like that. Hello, I have a question. A client texts me and I ask, besides using the PPE, how do we know we are not carrying the COVID-19 on our clothes? How would you respond? Hmm. How do we know that we're not carrying it? Well, the client wants to know how yeah. you know you're not carrying it on your clothes. Um. You know, the, the, the COVID-19 class that, that we uh, launched several weeks ago now, I guess, that, that so many people have taken, you know, one of the things that we address in that is how this virus spreads. And um, you can get it off of high-touch surfaces. You can grab a door handle that's been infected and then touch your face. Um, the idea of it just like, clinging to your clothes. I mean, it's not beyond the, the, the realm of possibility, but for, for the, for the most part, that's not, you know, haven't seen any research that, that indicates that that's, that's very probable or, 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 or very pervasive, especially if you're just going through your normal day-to-day -day operations. If you're working in a, in a, in a healthcare setting, if you're working on a COVID-19 ward, you'd have, you know, the proper, you know, gowns and other, 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 other PPE. Um, it's primarily spread airborne, I guess, other than the than high touch surfaces. I don't know how you would answer that specifically though, other than, than shoe covers, I guess, are one thing that if you're, you're using them, you'd make sure that you aren't picking it off of, uh, you know, some, some floor, some, some, some ground surface and, and, and carrying it into somebody's home. Even if you had it on your clothes, as long as the, the people living in the home weren't coming up and rubbing their hands on your clothes, which I would presume, <laughs> yeah, it's not like it's not like it would become airborne off of your, your 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 clothes again. I mean, you're not taking your your shirt off and shaking it in the house or anything. And the amount 
if you did have have it on your clothes, the amount that would like even if you were you know doing this. And I could see uh, the concern, right? I'm doing this and I'm, I'm um, maybe aerating whatever was on my shirt. Still, the amount that you're going to be putting into the air is not enough to, to be of concern. I, unless you have maybe 50 people all in the house doing this. Yeah. Um, but but the, the answer is tricky. Um, I'm going to give you that, Carmelina. The answer is tricky. Because it's kind, it's to me, it's kind of like the question, um, oh, what is that? What is that funny? It's not funny, but so are you still beating your wife? You know, that <laughs> question. Well, like, but I, but I never beat my wife. Yeah. No, because I never, you know, it's, it's an yeah. odd question because of when that. Did, when, did you, when did you stop beating your wife? Yeah, that's what it is. When did you stop beating your wife? So your question is like that. There, the question is where the problem is. The answer isn't the problem. The question's the problem. So how do we know that you're not carrying the COVID-19 on your clothes? Um, so I guess that probably what I would do is, yeah, actually, if you haven't taken the COVID-19 class, you do need to take it because, Tom, can you put that up there for me real quick? Sure. Um, because one of the things in, in that class is how long the virus remains viable on different surfaces. And um, material is one of them. So I might respond with something along the lines of, well, there's no guarantee that we are not carrying it on our clothing, but uh, the virus is only viable on, on this material and for this amount of time and Part of what we are doing to, you know, might even come up with something that you are doing to counteract that. I don't even know what that might be, though, to tell you the truth. I mean, actually, I, I would feel very safe just running a microfiber cloth on, on, my, um, on my uniform and then putting that into the into a plastic bag or dirty laundry and I would feel very, very safe. It's a tough, tough, again, that question is just a bad question. All right, yeah. go ahead, Tom. Um, could you explain about the COVID-19? COVID-19 class, we just did a modern cleaning, click okay. on more info. And, you know, one of, the, one, of the, one of the sections that we cover is, you know, how does the, uh, how does the virus spread and well, and she did take the class. Maybe go into the class, Carmelina, and look and see if you can find something. If the customer did, hopefully they asked you in writing. <laughs> because if they asked you in writing, I think it's an easier response because you can give a lot more information. If if they ask you in person, it's a tougher a tougher answer. And this is a this is an article that we went over last week. Maybe maybe Friday. Friday. It's a post. And this this the guy who does this po does this blog is, is really good, but he talks about how how it spreads and basically it's droplets and the droplets have the the RNA in it and you need about a thousand droplets in order to uh, become infected and there's a lot of different ways that you can get a thousand droplets, but you know just walking by somebody in a grocery store isn't going to do it, and even if somebody had it on their clothes. As long as it was on their clothes, you're not inhaling it. You're not getting it into your mouth or your eyes or your nose. So that really isn't going to be an issue. I'd be concerned about people's shoes because people's shoes come in contact with your floors. And that could be an issue. And that's why we wear the shoe covers. But if I have the virus, say, on my shirt or, or, or my pants, um, unless I'm doing anything to aerosol that, make that fry up, it really isn't. And it's moist and it's sticky and it typically takes a little bit. We talk about that in the class when we're making beds. I mean, we showed the technique of, of taking dirty linens off, but as a rule, the belief is with, 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 with a reasonable amount of care, it really isn't aerosoling, getting, getting back into the air. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a Sorry, Tom. It's a, no, it's a novel virus. There's not a ton of, you know, research speaking specifically to 
um, SARS-CoV-2 virus. So we don't know anything at a hundred percent level, but you know, there's a lot of studies that, 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 that talk about and, and show and from all the tracing that they've been doing, like over in Asia and other countries is that, that have the means to do that. Um, you know, I, I haven't seen one study that, that would suggest that if, if I have it on my clothes, then it's some way that I'm going to be infecting other people. I think in some ways it could work to your advantage, Carmelina, that she asked on your Facebook page because yeah. it's your opportunity to look like an expert, um, to, to, that you actually know what you're talking about and to talk about how you're mitigating all the risks, et cetera. I, I think it could work in your favor. You, talk about, talk watch. about your training, yeah. yeah talk about your training. Um, watch out though. Uh, right now, there are the people on the flip side that are like oh, the CDC and the WHO are lying to you, you know. So you you might get some of those people that are going to respond that you know what your sheep for believing all this stuff, whatever. Um, just don't engage if you get hit up by somebody like that. I would say, um, but use the opportunity to to sh talk about your training, your expertise. Uh, um, well, uh, well, all everything that you know, you can just copy and paste out of the out of the test too. Tom, I think this actually. Do you have time? What time is it? Two fifty-two. Yeah, you have time. Can you put up the um, the uh, PHC class too, the professional house cleaner class? You've probably sure. taken this too, Carmelina. I know. Um, um, this is also going to be a good place to be able to get some information about. Um, actually, I, when is this next one going out, Tom? Wednesday? Uh, Thursday. Thursday? Okay. Yes. And we're going to be talking about, well, can you give a quick rundown on Thursday's info? Uh, it's going to be it's going to be hygiene. It's going to be uh, cleaning for health. So it's going to be touching up on, uh, you know, it's going to include a little bit of, of, you know, viruses and, and, uh, you know, how, how they are spread and, and the risk, but it, it takes a more broader approach on pathogens in general germs, if you will, and talks about bacteria and fungi and the various other things that, 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 that we make, can make us uh, get sick in the home and our roles and professional house cleaners in terms of how we keep ourselves safe, how we, uh, keep our clients safe and the, and, and, and the best practices in terms of, you know, making sure that, that, that we're doing those things. So um, the whole chain of infection is much broader than just, just, just COVID. So this covers pretty much the full spectrum of anything that you're going to run into as a professional house cleaner. And that's the reason I was bringing it up, Carmelina. So you can hit the COVID information specifically, but then you can go broad and talk about these other things that are, in many ways, uh, a much larger risk, but have never really caused much of a problem because there's a lot of stuff that are kind of dangerous out there, right? Um, but it, 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 those also have not been a, a big problem. You wouldn't want to minimize the COVID-19, of course, and make it sound like, oh, this is not a big deal. Um, but there are a lot of things that you are trained for and know how to manage and handle. And that this is just one of them. So kind of um, giving the impression that you know what you're doing and you know how to handle it is what I'm thinking. Liz and Tom, thank you for doing such good work. Oh, good to see you, Ekaterina. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, don't don't rewind too fast unless you want to hear about PPP money because that's what we we're talking about until about 2.30 or I guess 5.30 uh, Eastern time. But you know, the, real, the, most, the best answer to the, the whole close thing is you're right. It, that's not even the right question. I mean, yeah. you know, the, 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 the bigger risk is catching it for somebody who is without symptoms and is, is shedding virus. And if we're wearing a face mask, that basically addresses that risk. You know, if you're not even you're not even going to have it on your clothes, how are you going to get it on your clothes unless you're shedding on yourself, in which case the face mask would, would, would still be preventing that. Yeah, it's just a, it's just a bad question. Yeah, it's totally a bad question. I said I don't like that question. <laughs> Let me give you a better one. Let me give you a better answer too. 
yeah, it's just it's a, it's a tough question. So uh, work, I, I would, if I was you, Carmelia, I would I would not post directly onto Facebook. If it was me, I would pull up a Word document, I would craft my response, and then I would give it to somebody that I trusted and ask them if it made them, I would ask them this specific question. If you read this, would it make you feel like, yeah, wow, that company knows what they're talking about? And if your whoever your trusted person is said, yeah, that totally does, great, then I'd post it. If they're like, well, you kind of sound like you were rambling, or well, you kind of sound like you're defensive, any of those answers, rework it, <laughs> work it again. Uh, but but try to get an answer that whoever reads the answer is going to feel like, wow, they really know what they're talking about. And, and that is what I would consider to be a good answer there. Uh, anything else you want to tell people about this PHC program, Tom? Uh, um, we haven't really talked about the price lately. Oh, what about the new platform? Yeah, so, we're moving on. Kind of by, by the end of the month, we're going to be on a new uh, learning management system that's going to give cleaning business owners the ability to log in themselves with as like, like an administrator and you can enroll your 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 own cleaning professionals and you can track their progress it's gonna it's gonna make it so much easier than the way that we do bulk uh enrollment now and we're we're gonna have that done by the not this week but by the end of next week we're gonna have that out um the class itself is uh basically the program itself is seven classes uh the third one, hygiene, is going to be going out later this week. Um, and four, five, six, and seven are all going to be coming out pop, pop, pop. They're all going to be out by, by the end of May. And after taking seven classes, there is a uh, an exam you take at the end, and you get a certification of completion after uh, successfully completing you know, the entire program. It's written for cleaning professionals, people who are spending their day cleaning homes every day. And we did this in a way to make it accessible, to make it affordable. This is the information that, you know, cleaning professionals, people are cleaning homes every day need in order to, uh, you know, do their jobs well, do it responsibly and understand why they're doing what it is that they're doing. Because without the why behind it, it's hard to fully commit, you know, and too often times, the bottle will tell you this is what you do, but if you really don't understand the why behind it, there's a greater likelihood that you might not even pay attention. You might just go ahead and do something else that seems to make sense just because nobody's ever really explained the why behind it. So that's what this is. It's non-prescriptive. We use the analogy, it's like a uh, driver's ed manual, which applies regardless of what state you're in, what city you're in, country, urban area, it really doesn't matter, um, which is different than your cleaning procedures in your specific company or just your, 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 your procedures within your own company, which is more like the owner's manual for a specific car. So this will lay over top of any business model in, in, in the house cleaning industry. And we're excited about it. This is uh, one of the most, uh, awesome things that I think that, that we've ever engaged in. And I think it's going to uh, have a material impact on making this a, a, a better industry for, for all stakeholders, for your clients, for you as business owners, and for the people who, who work hard, you know, cleaning homes, making it happen every day. I also wanted to bring up um, one more thing. So this manual that you may have seen before, the Professional House Cleaning Technicians Manual, uh, widely accepted as um, a, an authoritative work uh, for our industry is written by, I don't know if you can see those names, two of the names on there are Tom Stewart and Janice Stewart. And those are the two main people that are creating the content for, our, for the program, for the professional house cleaning program. I don't know that there, is there anything in here, Tom, that is not addressed in our program? Um, no, nothing, nothing that is, is particularly relevant. To be honest with you, um, when we wrote that book and put it together, 
as, as much as we wrote it for, or at least the stated goal was to make it for our house cleaning professionals. And it was the goal. And it's good for, for house cleaning professionals to get. There's a lot of stuff in there that that's more written for business owners, or at least some of it is. And basically it's kind of like anything else you do. When you, after you, you know, you get a chance to do it a, a few times, you figure out better ways of doing it. So the material, the way that we're delivering it this time, I think is a much better fit in terms of not you know, being able to do it online, being able to do it in small part, just the way the information is presented. This is, is, is better suited for your, your, your cleaning professionals, the, the folks that are cleaning. Definitely more absorbable. Yeah. Definitely more absorbable. People are going to walk away remembering the information in the in the PhD program where this stuff was a little bit difficult, a, a little bit, a little bit difficult to um, to absorb. Okay. Hey, Tom, I just realized we're out of time. We have one minute left. Uh, if you guys have any questions, hold them until tomorrow when we'll be on again. Uh, did we already have somebody? Yes, we're bringing Megan Likes on tomorrow. If you all don't know who let Megan Likes is, be on tomorrow. I promise you, you will love her. She is a delight. She will answer all of our questions and she is just a font of knowledge. You are going to love tomorrow's program. Megan Rock. Make sure you tell your friends. Make sure everybody knows that Megan's going to be joining us tomorrow and uh, certainly hope to see you guys here at uh, five o'clock Eastern tomorrow. See you then. Bye-bye. Yeah. Have a good night. Bye.